Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we believe mental illness can be temporary and transformative. Stay tuned for innovative, effective tools from experts in the field of mental health. Hosted by Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. This podcast aims to change the narrative around mental illness. Move from a place of fear to a place of hope and solutions. Here on On Your Mind. My next guest is Katherine Adams. Katherine received her MSW from Michigan State University. She worked for over 30 years for the Clinton Eaton Ingham County Mental Health Board in Lansing, Michigan. She worked as a senior clinician and clinical manager, serving consumers with mental illness and their families. Ms. Adams has served as project director for multiple national research endeavors exploring the benefits of early intervention following a first episode of psychosis. Ms. Adams is also the owner and clinical director of ETCH, Early Treatment and Cognitive Health, which provides RAISE Navigate coordinated specialty care interventions to young adults experiencing a first episode of psychosis and their families. Ms. Adams is the consultant trainer for first episode psychosis programs in the state of Michigan. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for this opportunity to chat with you about uh, this important topic. Well, let's start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this field. I did want to make a quick mention that um, Journey and his family are very important to me, and I think it's very meaningful that Journey has brought us to this conversation and that I feel like um, this will allow us an opportunity to expand our understanding and our awareness about the topic we're going to talk about today, but also my hope is to increase access and opportunity to people who might be struggling with mental health distress. So my career is longer than I would like to admit. It's over 30 plus years working in mental health. Um, Most of that time spent working with people who've uh, experienced some fairly serious disruption in their lives related to a mental health um, experience. But more recently in the last 10 years, and that's what I'm most um, involved in right now, I've been engaged in work that is specific to intervening early with young people who may be experiencing psychosis. Well, that's a a critically important topic. And as I understand it, very little is known about it in the general public. Well, I think what we're up against, and we are up against this in most areas when we think about mental health, I I think that the stigma and um, kind of the way that uh, mental health challenges are Um, are are portrayed in in media and other venues have led us to kind of go into the shadows with this. And it's not allowed us to openly come forward and speak our truth about things we may be experiencing. So I think the um, efforts recently, I would say beginning in 2008 in some parts of the country, but really taking on some steam in 2010 and beyond in the United States, with an emphasis on intervening early with young adults who are experiencing psychosis. And I I like to always share a little bit about some of the statistics that that make it so important. And some of those things are the fact that there are approximately 100,000 youth and young adults experiencing psychosis each year. And I like to think about that as a per day number. So 274 young people per day And I happen to hail from East Lansing. I'm right across the street from Michigan State. So when I'm talking to young people and their families, I like to bring it into a perspective that maybe makes sense and can be a little personal. So over at MSU's campus, there's maybe 45,000 young people over there uh, enrolled in some academic path. And so if you use that math that I just used, three out of every 100 young people is a statistic we use, that would equate to 1,200 to 1,500 young people over on MSU's campus right now. So I think it's important to understand that this is a more common experience than we know. And one of the ways in which we've kind of lost ourselves in the U.S. is that people uh, were waiting up to two years or more to get support and to have kind of 
an identification that would lead to some supports around what their experience was. So systems of care were waiting for people to come to them. And I think we're making huge strides in, in that way and that the World Health Organization actually recommends that the wait be no longer than 12 weeks, um, that you're going to have the most um, impact and, and efficacy if you're able to uh, partner with people and bring support to bear within 12 weeks of, of identifying um, this, this experience. And then um, I, I think another um, you know, disparaging statistic is that three times as many young people who've experienced psychosis will drop out of school compared to their peers. So imagine the time of life when people are most often experiencing a first episode of psychosis, and that is usually somewhere in the range of age 15, you know, mid-teens to, to early 30s. So that's a time in life when people are really on a path to discovering themselves, to imagining their next steps in their lives, to um, emancipating and individuating from families. And this happens at a time uh, when it can lead people to kind of lose their way and, and uh, move away from some of those important developmental tasks. Um, we also think that most experiences like this uh, begin before the age of 24. And as I mentioned, 15 to 30 is kind of the age range of eligibility for our program. And half of those young people don't get the help when they need it. So, so the result of all this can be uh, downward kind of impacts such as school dropout, incarceration, homelessness, and sadly suicide, which is the second leading cause of death for teens and young adults. What's important to know though, is that uh, intervention works. We're really excited about this intervention. I like to think about it as a revolution of hope. I know I didn't coin the phrase, but I think it really applies to this experience in the United States. We've gone from say 10 sites back in the, the mid 2000s to I think we're, we're nearing over 200 programs. Um, I may be a little off on that statistic, but uh, 200 programs that could provide this kind of uh, coordinated uh, holistic support to young people and their families. Um, so we know that uh, medications can be part of a remission for young people. About 77% of people experiencing psychosis will have some relief of symptoms with medication. Um, but two thirds of those people will not experience uh, recoveries in functional ways in the areas of, of their social lives, school and work. So, so that's uh, kind of the response of this program is to bring support in all those domains and to understand that uh, there's a whole person there that really needs support in, in many ways, not just kind of traditional. So let um, me just interrupt support. you there because yeah. something you said hit me. Did you just say that two thirds of the people that get medication support for their psychosis don't recover in functional ways? They don't have as robust recovery frequently in the areas of work and school and social domains. Um, All right, so that, so would mean, that, that would mean it'd be really important to develop, I'll use your word again, this a robust kind of a comprehensive way to support people who have that. Because I know that from my own personal experience, it's not a terminal illness. It isn't, you know, many people recover from a psychotic episode and, and get back to full active lives. It can't be that two thirds of the people who have this don't have a chance to recovery. That's just the issue that if all they're getting is medication support, it's not enough. Well, I would think we, our experience would support that, that when you bring multiple supports and multiple um, uh, competencies into the mix in terms of things that people can choose from and that make sense to them at this time in their life and this time in this particular experience, I think then we often see that uh, momentum and traction is happening in all kinds of important domains in a lot young person's life. So this model is considered what we refer to as a coordinated specialty care model, meaning it coordinates several specialties and brings those to the table uh, for a young person and their family. 
Um, and I could share a little bit about those if you think that would please. be of interest. Yes, please. Um, so, so the different uh, competencies on our team and the different things that would be offered in this early support would be individualized therapy. And that's, uh, you know, kind of a one-to-one -one relationship that you would form with a therapist. And I think what's different about that and what really speaks to me about it is it has a lot of um, emphasis on positive psychology and it has a lot of emphasis on um, resilience and this idea that within all of us exists an inherent resilience. There's strength that we draw upon. There's a well that we dip our cup into when we're facing difficulty in our lives. And that exists there. And if we can shine a brighter light on that when people are experiencing distress and despair, then they can bring those inherent qualities to bear and to support their um, wellness. Uh, so the individual therapy support is very much a strength-based, um, resiliency-focused intervention. There is also some emphasis on skills and, and, and what, can, what are the tools that work for you, very individualized to you, and how you manage when you're experiencing heightened distress or stress. We all face stress in our everyday lives. Um, and, and we need to have tools that, that help us soothe ourselves and ease those different stresses. So the individual therapy intervention would also offer those things. And again, very tailored to what the young person identifies as useful and important and congruent with their values for themselves in their lives. Um, so that's a big piece of, of the support that's available. Um, another piece is family support, because as you might imagine, when you love someone and you see them going through this kind of difficulty or this kind of crisis, um, you can feel very bewildered and lost and alone. And, and so uh, we offer support to families with, if the young person wants to include significant people in their lives, be it uh, biological relatives or other natural supports in their lives. And we uh, find it really meaningful and powerful to, to gather together and to bring all that wisdom into one place. Because obviously family has wisdom that we as a treatment entity don't have access to. So, so we're really looking to families for some of that wisdom and some of that guidance. Uh, but we also find that um, going through some of these, this kind of distress uh, has a strong impact on families and, and it can be helpful to kind of ground everybody again in kind of a shared understanding of what's going on, you know, what information is helpful, what is missing, what do people want to know more about, um, how can they be helpful? How is communication working for the family? Are there ways to strengthen it or enhance how things are going? Um, so we really uh, hope that uh, a young person will be receptive to that part of this support is to involving their family and getting everybody together to, to kind of find that sweet spot that, that helps a young person um, thrive. And, and uh, because this is happening at a time when, when probably every fiber in a young person's body is saying separate, emancipate, move away from parents, resist that kind of authority. And then a crisis happens and it's the natural response of parents um, when you love someone to come closer to them when they're in crisis. So I always think about it as a safety net that you've lowered as your young person is kind of getting ready to, to launch, gets brought way back up again. And um, that can create some tensions and, and so helping everyone understand kind of that phenomena and figure out how to help a young person get back to kind of manifesting some of that natural developmental impulse is helpful. So the family support is a big part of it. I think another really important part, which tends to be uh, something that I think young people find most appealing, is we have a team member who provides support about work and school goals. Um, Typically, this is occurring for a young person when they might be in the midst of completing high school or thinking about what's after high school or um, thinking about a job or having a job. Um, so, so those domains of one's life can, um, especially if something like a hospitalization is involved during the crisis period, that frequently creates, you know, someone's gone on a bit of a detour and helping them figure out how to find their way back. Do they wanna find their way back? Do they wanna just 
brainstorm a little bit about what they're imagining for themselves. What are they curious about? Where do they see themselves next? So bringing supported around work and school or other kind of next step visions that people have for themselves is very important. Um, there's two more members of the team. Uh, there is psychiatry. And I think what I like to emphasize here is that the, the psychiatric approach in my 30 plus years of working in this field and working a lot with psychiatry, I find the approach in this intervention is different because it, it really rests in this place of um, a practice called shared decision making. And I think that anybody, any of us who've been to a physician can relate to this hierarchy that kind of quietly exists. That, that the doctor is a person with knowing and, and that no, we don't have the knowing, so the knowing is imparted on us. We try to level that playing field and say that we're all in this together. We all have different wisdom and expertise that we bring to it. And the doctor has some sorts of wisdom. The young person has some sorts of wisdom. Family might have some wisdom, different ones of us on the team might have some wisdom. So we bring that all into a space where hopefully there's a real rich kind of complete conversation that can happen around medications and whether they will or will not play a role in the person's recovery yeah, and, 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 and wellness. How, and how much of a role. How much of a role. Because and, in, and, historically, the, you know, in our culture, the, the idea is if something happens that's that far out of our experience, we go to the doctor and we say, throw something at this, fix this. Mm -hmm. And if all the doctor has in his or her toolkit is medication, then that's all that happens. And as you were just saying, you've learned and the research indicates that a multifaceted approach is best for the outcome. Absolutely. I would wholeheartedly agree with that. And for me personally, too, I, I suppose I've learned that I want to resist an impulse to over medicalize the experience, um, to to understand that there's a lot of things that contribute, because I, I I think we have to be cautious not to make the brain the enemy. Um, we have to be cautious to understand that there's a lot of things that might go into a person's experience, and there's a lot of mystery, and there's a lot of things we maybe need to seek to understand, and. Um, and I think this, this approach and, and our doctors here are especially good at kind of um, being uh, collaborative, collaborative about, about um, medications and, and what that experience is like and, and what, what, what side effects might there be, what other stigma related um, factors get brought into the person's experience and, and how to really try to be um, fully inviting that conversation from the young person. Um, because if we, if we make it so it's like you were saying earlier, Timothy, if we make it so it's only about that, only about medications and treating it in that way, then we've kind of conveyed that, um, uh, um, you know, like a powerlessness, like, well, it's, it's, it's uh, something happening in your brain and, and therefore um, I, I, I worry that we convey futility and there'll be a loss of hope and a loss of motivation if, if we villainize our, our brain. <laughs> so, so I like this approach because it really has a balanced understanding that there are lots of things that might be important in supporting someone um, in understanding what's happening and in cultivating wellness in their in their lives. Excellent. So you, you mentioned there were two more team members, one of them is a psychiatry and what's the other one? The other one is is newer to our teams um, in Michigan. Uh, but I think nationally, there's a real um, a real impetus right now to bring peers to our teams. And peers are uh, people who have had a similar experience in their own lives and have journeyed with it and have manifested some uh, wellness and, and have um, tools and ideas and, and ways of understanding it. And, and, um, and quite frankly, 
if you haven't experienced it, um, you, can't, you can't operate from that same space. And, and so a peer, someone with lived experience, has um, a unique ability to connect with a person in a very different way than all the other team members can. Um, so we're very excited that our teams um, across the country really are bringing peers into the experience, not only peers with lived experience, but in some states, it's something newer even that we're trying um, what's called family peers or family partners. So a family who's been through something with somebody they care about, who maybe can really identify and resonate with a, a, a family who is in the at the front end of it or just starting the experience. So it's really different. I mean, I feel like I'm a person with a lot of capacity for empathy, but but can I relate in that that way as a person who's lived it, you know, who maybe has had a a, a voice hearing experience or something like that. Maybe I haven't had that in the same way as as a peer can relate to that with a young person who's going through that or something similar. Yeah, and then again, the same thing holds for the family. If you've had a family member go through an experience like that, you are a valuable resource to other family who have that happen. Um, there's Absolutely. A, there's a level of, you know, the shock value and then the getting over it that if you've never been through a psychotic episode with somebody, it it's just terrifying because you have no concept no way to contain what you're experiencing or what the other person's experiencing. So that's why I would see families being very useful in supporting other families through a process like this. Yeah, and I'm excited about that. And, and just on a, on a kind of a, just to, to, to bring at least into the sphere some of the challenges, um, you know, with um, kind of finance in the in this world of this intervention is there there isn't reimbursement um, in most ways for for peers or family partners now there is for peers under the medicaid certain certain kind of things but those are areas i don't want to spend a lot of time with that today i mostly want to talk about about um, this this set of supports and how we think it can be helpful to get young people to these supports early but i think we can't neglect that we need to make bigger changes in terms of how things are funded in the healthcare system. So, Agreed. I remember you said something about a, a program. It had an acronym and there was some research saying that it was quite effective. However, the research also said when that support was withdrawn, the, the results disappeared and you were working on a program that would oh, yeah. have that continuing support. Yeah, I think a lot of um, programs across the country are starting to recognize that um, we have to think about how to kind of support transition from these more intensive interventions. These interventions are fairly, you know, intensive at the beginning. Um, and we have to do a better job, I think, of figuring out what helps people step away from the community they have within this program to a community that they create outside of these walls. Um, and because I, I think you and I spoke about this in one of our earlier conversations, I, I really am excited about getting in touch with this idea that belonging is really important to us as human beings. And um, this experience of psychosis, however it manifests for a person, can be very isolating. You mentioned that for families as well. It can be very isolating for families. There's a there's a real disconnect. I like there's a there's a woman who is part of NAMI. Um, she started um, the NAMI family to family quite some years ago, many years ago. And she always said that mental illness is the only illness for which nobody brings you a covered casserole. And I think that's so true. There's so much isolation when someone you know is going through a, a mental health distress or crisis. We we kind of just lay low and we step away. Um, so there's a lot of isolation. So, so we wanted to come up with something that would help people kind of gather up all this strength that they've manifested for themselves and built for themselves in their, in their um, collaboration with us and figure out kind of how to take that into their lives where they build some community with, with people in their, 
you know, where they live. And so we started a program, we're calling it NAV to go. And the, the overall program I've been talking about thus far is called Navigate. It's a coordinated specialty care program. Um, it's a model that's widespread across the United States. And um, we are doing a, a program here called NAV to go where we're um, working with people who really have a lot of kind of footing you know, back kind of in their lives and, and in things that were important to them, be it school or relationships or faith community or, or whatever it was. They're, they've started to kind of reach outside of here and, and connect with those things. And we want to figure out how to really concretize that, really make that solid for people. Because um, I think it's natural that that as things are getting back on track for people they'll need us less and so we want to make sure we do a good job at um with that transition um because as you mentioned there has been some research to suggest that when the um coordinated specialty care services are pulled back that that people uh may have a hard time sustaining the gains that they made during during the um intervention or during the supports so we're really trying to understand that better and it's not just us there's there's people all across the country uh really looking hard at that and seeing what we can learn and understand about how to be most helpful yeah i i i brought to mind dr mark hyman who talks about this recipe for a healthy life it's not rocket science there are these you know five or seven or eight different factors and you know food and water and sleep and exercise they're the usual ones people think about but in that there's he goes on to say love a sense of purpose in life and connection to community these are critical aspects that if we just take a one prong approach to a problem whether it's the physical or the occupational we miss that bigger picture of support, which really allows most of us to carve out a life that we enjoy or have have yeah. some sense of fulfillment in. I really agree with that. I've become more keenly aware of it in, in my own life and, and in, in my work life that, that we can't neglect that. We need to understand that that's essential. Well, and there are some people that, and I've spoken to recently, I interviewed a young woman who ended up going through her own long mental health adventure and um she talks about it as having been transformative mm -hmm. that with the proper support with her intelligence and of course she's oh, decidedly above average intelligence the issue is that it when i have a mental health challenge it isn't the the end of my life or my career as as we've been taught to believe so often people of my age the stigma against mental health, as you mentioned, it's the only disease process where the community doesn't come together and support your family and bring you a potluck. And so yeah. the idea that not only is it not this end of everything I had hoped for, it can actually be something that I use and, and my support team might use to help me create a whole different kind of life that I'd never imagined before. Yes, and to, to that point, I, I think something that I've loved about this 10 year chapter in my career, um, and I have to give a nod to Michigan because I think our leadership in Michigan has really allowed us to kind of, we start with this core support called Navigate, which is, you know, got strong um, um, foundation and really strong evidence base supports and, and a, really great team nationally to kind of pull from as needed. Um, but within Michigan, we've added some things toward that end that 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 this people are, we as humans are multifaceted. We have all different ways of understanding our experience. So we've added some things to our intervention uh, here that I think have been really helpful. We've added something called CBTP, and that stands for Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Psychosis. And I neglected to mention at the, the head of this, I apologize, that when you think about psychosis, what are we talking about? And I think we're talking about a couple of things when we think about the nomenclature that we use. We're talking about um, a shift in people's experience around how information is processed. 
So information comes in and how it's processed may um, feel different and may uh, include an experience of voice hearing or some kind of other perceptual experience like a visual experience or even a olfactory or tactile experience. So some kind of change um, and the nomenclature used for that is like a hallucination. Another factor would be a really strong uh, fixed set of beliefs that um, others don't share, that the, the rea the, it, it doesn't feel like it's resting in kind of a shared reality um, because there's a lot of objection to it or, or, or denial of it from the outside world. Um, so people might have a strong belief or a strong um, understanding of what is going on for them and that in the nomenclature is referred to as delusional thinking. I think one of the other things that's especially hard for young people is there can be impacts in terms of um, cognition, like um, how quickly you process information, um, your memory, your attention, your focus, your concentration. Those are some of the early things that even pre any kind of you know, psychosis experience, uh, looking back, parents will often often say, oh yes, I now that I look back, it kind of felt like teenager to me, but there were some grades slipping or there were um, some difficulty kind of with follow through and things like that. So when we're thinking about psychosis, those are the things we're thinking about. And, and um, so CBT for psychosis kind of looks at those experiences and, um, collaborates with a person to help them make meaning of them. I think for a long time, we kind of thought that what a person believed strongly that got labeled as a delusion was um, didn't have any fit. It just was random. And I think now we we understand so much better that it isn't random. It's, it's based on probably some experience the person had that kind of led to the to that formulation of that belief or that particular narrative in terms of what the voice hearing experience is, that there's meaning to be made of it. Um, and CBT aims to kind of support people in creating meaning. And two things can happen as a result of that. I think one, people experience less distress as a result of the, the psychosis experience. And two, it, it may become kind of less of a barrier to kind of things they want to accomplish in their lives. Because sometimes the experience can be so distressing that it gets in the way of kind of outcomes they imagine for themselves or just, just uh, basic functioning. And I think CBTP, in addition to some of the skills and stuff that are part of the individual resiliency therapy that we talked about earlier, can really uh, manifest um, some relief, some skills, some ways of understanding. And it isn't that kind of approach that wants to pry the thinking out of somebody's hand and prove it false. That's not helpful. That encourage, imagine if somebody came to you and said, you know, you're not um, the person who manages on your mind. Um, and try to just kind of hammer you that that truth wasn't your truth. Well, you would you would get activated. You would want to defend that. So I think when we're trying to to pry this 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 way of thinking or understanding experience out of somebody's hand, basically, we're we're only encouraging them to grip all the fiercer to it. And it it creates a sense of dependence if they buy into what I'm telling them, that they can't trust their perception, mm -hmm. then they become dependent upon other people. And the whole point of moving forward through a process like that is to learn to manage and trust my perception again, learn to understand how it might have gotten a little bit off target or even woven in some extrasensory perceptions that I didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And there are people who and, and this would be the goal for most people that I work with to help them learn to read their own perception and trust their own judgment again. Mm -hmm. Because if they have an episode like the ones you're talking about, one of the things that happens is they start questioning their own perception. That's very true. That's very true. So I think the CBTP um, 
you know, I love the blend that we have in our programs because we have the the IRT, which is kind of, you know, make honing in on the strengths and the resilient qualities and and the IRT you know, stands for um, individual resiliency training. So that's kind of the individual strength based positive psychology approach. And then we added the CBTP to that. Um, we're also going to add it's coming up. I'm very excited about it. We're going to be adding compassion focused therapy. Um, we're having a trainer, Charlie uh, Harriet Maitland, come to train us in that. And I had a two day training with him. So that was very appealing to me because it is about developing a compassion itself. Because, um, you know, a lot of times when people are experiencing this and they may be faltering in certain parts of their life, there's a real tendency to get really self deprecating and, and you know, to, to self stigmatize even, um, you know, to, to, get, to get bound up in shame. And, and so this compassionate um, focused therapy is really about how do you cultivate a, a compassionate self? And that thereby brings on your ability to soothe yourself and to get back in touch with your drive system, which is about relationships and goals and connectedness because your threat system, which might be experienced as voice hearing or worrisome thoughts about the intentions of other people, um, that system, the threat system gets so large that it crowds out our ability to, to have drive and to soothe. And, and so compassion focused therapy, um, all of our Michigan folks are gonna get trained in kind of how to bring that to the relationships with people. Um, so I'm excited for that in May of this year. Excellent. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I to that issue, I so often tell people, um, Sylvia Borstein, was interviewed and she's this Jewish Buddhist grandmotherly type person. And she said, you know, when I feel upset, I put my hand over my heart space and I talk very gently to myself and I say, Timmy, sweetheart, you're in pain. Take a few deep breaths. Then we'll calm down after we're relaxed a little bit after the pain waves are gone, then we'll look at what's going on and then we'll decide yeah. what to do. But for now, Timmy, you know, you're in pain. And so this compassionate approach, this be gentle with yourself is something that I push with people because if I can't have it for myself, I can't really have it for others. And if I can't have that gentle approach with others, I can't make that serious connection. And the connection and using my own skills in connection with others, that sense of community that Mark Hyman talks about, is really the thing that gives me the strength to get through big episodes of change in my life. And I like um, that. Yes. And I remember not too long ago, I had a, um, a person in therapy who came and said, you know, she went to this big, big stretch to go do something she'd never done before, a week long program where she was going to be a counselor at a camp somewhere. And she came back and she said, you know what? What I learned, much to my surprise, during this week was the more I asked for help, the stronger I felt. Mm. And her entire life prior to that had been the opposite. Mm -hmm. Because she came from a not so healthy family situation. And if she would ask for help, she would get ridiculed or mm -hmm. attacked. And so in a healthy system, when we ask for help, we learn something, we feel stronger. It gets an in. So that to me that's tied in with that i need to be gentle with myself if i'm stuck and then i just beat myself up because i can't figure it out then i i rob myself of the strength of being able to ask for help and when i ask for help what i'm doing i'm connecting with someone or something outside of me and that can be this synergy for strength which I really like about the core of your program being this multifaceted approach bringing in peers bringing in different clinical experts and family support. I think it's a fabulous right. thing. Right. And to the point you were making, though, about uh, compassion itself, I think that's one of the things that I really like about this training. And we're going to get this specialized version of it for people experiencing psychosis. But it's not only um, it, it's the receiving and the giving of compassion that you, you kind of need to cultivate in yourself. And I think too, it's also in compassion. Let's say you do have a voice hearing experience and there's a voice who's pretty critical and says you're going to fail at something. Well, it's having compassion for that voice, for that narrative that's going on. 
um, you know, and kind of saying, I know you're worried about me. I know you're, um, you're looking out for me, but, but I've got this. And that's taken directly from some work that um, Eleanor Longden and, and Charlie Harriet um, Maitland did on this compassion itself, uh, the compassion for voices in particular. Well, it's really, you know, one of the core pieces of um, the internal family systems work where I get to recognize that whatever part of me or aspect of me or motivation within me is probably there for a good reason. Yes. You know, right? It probably right. developed Signaling at a time when I was in a crisis and I needed to watch out for people with a booming voice or people who were violent or people who could be emotionally abusive. And so at that point in my life, all the only defense mechanisms I had were the real primitive ones of either attack or shut down or. Mm -hmm. So when that goes off in me, when I'm an adult, it it's letting me know, hey, there's some situation here that needs some attention. But if the only aspect or personal skills I have available to get motivated with that memory of this trauma are my primitive skills, that's not so productive as an adult. And I think you mentioned the word trauma. And I think in the experience of psychosis, we've become more aware of the role that trauma likely plays in a large percent of the experience of psychosis. Um, and I think the CBTP, all of these different things we've been able to weave together here, um, takes this kind of longitudinal look at what is what is the story, like you were talking about these, these primitive bits of armor that got brought into play. Um, what, what is the story that you have? We all have a backstory that we're bringing right to this moment we're in right now. And sometimes if we can understand what, what part of that backstory is, is bringing on a particular emotion or a particular um, intensity in voice hearing or a particular line of thinking about, um, you know, for example, somebody stealing my intellectual property from my um, heating system or whatever the experience may be, that's not just some kind of random string of things. That has, I believe, a foundation in some earlier single singular experience or earlier um network of experiences that brings you to th that your, your mind your um psyche went to construct that for a reason you know that, that that's what i think and i've seen people really you know grab at a powerful kind of um piece of their own healing when they can understand that and make a few of those connections um, and so we work to facilitate that for people who are interested in that. Excellent. Excellent. Well, so you've mentioned your facility. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Is it inpatient? Is it outpatient? How do people get access to you? Well, it, as, as I mentioned, across the country, I think almost all 50 states have these um, early intervention programs. And even, even some states now have something called clinical high risk. We're even getting so we want to kind of discover when people might be having difficulties even before a major crisis like a hospitalization or something like that so there's all kinds of just wonderful innovation going on across the country in and across the um the world actually uh, but in michigan we have right now we have four sites that are early intervention sites um mine it, that i um, am the clinical director for is here in east lansing and um, we're an outpatient model. We're not an inpatient setting. Um, though we, were, we do work closely with uh, local inpatient um, uh, facilities if, if that's needed or if people are there and we're trying to get them kind of into our program and so forth. We have a good collaboration with them. Um, so the four programs that exist in Michigan are in different parts of the state and they're all outpatient facilities. Um, so that's kind of how we're structured here. Um, and as I said, most states are really increasing their offering of this type of intervention. We're really working hard uh, to do that. Okay, so as we wind down our time, 
I like to ask people, is there some aspect of what you do or you're passionate about that I haven't asked you about yet that you want to make sure we put in the interview? I think we we really covered it well, but I do like to, I guess, give extra emphasis to this idea that we're we're supporting a whole person here. And I think we've 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 operated a little narrowly in, you know, in my history in mental health. And I'm excited at the way that we're expanding that. So so again, here we we offer all the things I talked about, but we also have a mindfulness coach that comes in and works with us as a team, you know, because I think it's important you're in this profession. It, it's important to cultivate our own wellness. Um, but we also have uh, made that available to our young people. We did a family mindfulness workshop. Um, we also offer a lot of community engagement activities, again, to help people, what we were talking about earlier, kind of bridge from the support that they get here to, a, to community involvement. Um, we're going to run a nutrition group. Um, I think our first one is mid-March. Um, because there are some impacts, as, as you're probably aware of, that are related to one, uh, there may be some medication side effects that affect kind of health. And, and then there also is, uh, there, there are some impacts around motivation so that people who might have had um, certain healthy lifestyle things in place, uh, they, they kind of uh, lose touch with some of that. So we're looking at ways to, to cultivate and restore that for people who are interested. We always really try to resist imposing our agenda. We really want people to self-actualize here and it not be about what we think they need or what we think is best, but we want to offer them opportunities to kind of, again, like I said, put a toe in that water. What does that feel like? Is that something you want to pursue further? So we have the wellness. We're starting nutrition. We've been doing some yoga. Um, uh, we, we try to kind of do some of these things through faith uh, locations in our community. We really want to kind of um, be out there in our community and, and, and use some of that presence to reduce the overall stigma um, and to bring people uh, closer to one another, you know, so that it's your neighbors who you have some kinship with. And, and it, it's not only here that you can get that. You can get that in other parts of your life. Wonderful. Well, so how do people find out more about you? In well, there people? is, a, there are a couple of online resources and I can um, provide those links. So those could be shared. One is there's uh, something called PEPnet, which is the early psychosis network. And it has a, what I think they refer to it as a treatment tracker or something. It's some kind of United States tool that allows you to, um, link in to see where a program like ours is, if, depending on where you live. Another one, a website that I just love, and I feel I follow them on Facebook, I'm on their website, and they actually um, designed, helped us design our website is strong365.org. Um, and our website is michiganminds.org. And um, I'll provide those links and those perhaps could be shared because those are some good ways to find out uh, is there a resource like this close to you? Excellent. Excellent. Well, I greatly appreciate your time and the work you're doing. You're, it's, it's quite a blessing to have people like you out there helping us. And um, I look forward to our next contact. Well, thank you, Timothy. I really enjoyed this opportunity to talk with you about, about this. I'm really passionate about it. And I, I think um, it, it really offers an opportunity to not have uh, the devastating kind of, you know, continually downward trend for people experiencing this. I think there's so much hope and, and opportunity now. Yeah, well, hope is here and you're part of bringing it to us. So thank you so much. Appreciate well, thank it. Thank you. I appreciate right. it. Take care. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast offered by Journey's Dream where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening.